Uh, but this morning, if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to read a verse of Scripture together, and then we're going to jump right into the Word of God this morning for this Easter 2020 message and ask God to be with us today. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 6, uh, Jesus is uh, before the people, and uh, we know what he said to the council there, and that's what he is answering the council. 26 and 6, uh, 64, I'm sorry. 26 and 64. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. He is guilty of death. The title of my message today is Innocent Unto Death. Our Savior was innocent, and yet He paid the price of death and guilt. Can we pray together this morning? Lord, we love you. We thank you for your presence that is so real wherever we are this morning, however we're joining today. Oh Lord, I pray that you would minister to this congregation today, these precious people that call this their church, others that may be joining with us this morning. I pray over them today. Far and wide today, God, we just need you to minister to us, to come and to bless us and to strengthen us today. And we're going to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for these things. For it's in the lovely name of Jesus we ask this today. In the name of our risen Savior, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. And I would, uh, would like to jump right into this message this morning. Innocent unto death. In Matthew chapter 27, we see where uh, Judas has uh, betrayed our Savior. He has... Uh, decided that he is wanting to redact that now. He's wanting to go back and to change that. He's wanting to come back and to repent for what he has done. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 3 says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. Judas, 30 pieces of silver. Today's worth, our expending power, approximately $20,000. As you heard my devotion earlier this week, why so cheap, Judas? After Jesus was taken to be crucified. He came back with the 30 pieces of silver and he wanted to return it to the priest and to the temple. Knowing, however, that it was money that would have been used to have bloodshed, the priest would not accept it back into the treasury. So they took the 30 pieces and they brought it and bought the potter's field. This morning we can all surmise what caused Judas to betray our Jesus? What was it that caused Judas to accept this bribe to betray our Savior? Was it because he was a zealot and he wanted Jesus to come to power? There are many that say maybe he wanted to force the issue. Maybe he wanted Jesus to arise to power quickly. He wanted, they wanted, he wanted Jesus to assume that that powerful position, and so he thought, if I do this, it will just uh, uh, speed up the process. Others uh, say that maybe Judas was just jealous of others, maybe even jealous of Jesus himself. Was it because he was simply greedy, or he had a love for money that went beyond the norm? This morning, I could sit here and I could surmise every reason. I could investigate every why, as to why Judas would do 
what he did. But we do have a very clear perspective of Judas after this has taken place. It's no uh, guesswork. There's no trying to figure out exactly what he said because it's very clear. He came and he said, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. You see, the verdict that came in the court uh, for Judas was this man was innocent. This morning I'm going to nail Judas' name to this tree because Judas, after surmising himself, after deciding what he really decided to look to, he understood after it was all over that he was an innocent man. And so today we can take and we can nail Judas' name to this tree because we know that Judas, in the end, his verdict said, this man did not deserve to die on an old rugged cross. This man was innocent and he was pure. We can turn our attention now to Matthew 27 and we can look at the Scripture where it says that there was a lady that came to Pilate, his wife, and he said, this is what the Scripture says in verse 19, when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. In a world where women were to be quiet, where they were not to make appearances unless they were called for, we see the desperate plea from Pilate's wife. She came forth and said, What kind of dream would that have been that she would come and suffer and come and take the chance to go before Pilate like this or bring a word to Pilate, a powerful man? She said, I can't just sit here after I have seen this powerful dream. I must come forth and bring this word to my husband. I know that I have had disturbing dreams in my life. I've had children who have raced into my room at night in the midst of a nightmare, disturbed by a vision in the mind that was so real that it made your heart race, your body sweat. And even after you were awakened, you were still surrounded by a spirit of fear. We have all had nightmares. We have all had dark dreams. We have all had things come to us in a nighttime such as this. And Pilate's wife was suffering in a dream. She suffered so real in the dream that she took a chance to get word to her husband, even though you're sitting on that judgment seat. Hear me today. This is a righteous man. And so she states her case. Have nothing to do with that just man. The verdict in the court of Pilate's wife said this man is innocent. So today I will nail one of these to this cross today because the Pilate's wife said he is innocent. He does not deserve what he is about to receive. And so Pilate's wife, we know she also uh, gave us a verdict and said, don't nail him to that tree because he's an innocent and a just man. We can also see in Luke chapter 23 that Herod had a say in this as well. Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, he said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I have examined him before you, and have found no fault in touching these things whereof ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. Pilate was desperate to get out of this verdict. He was desperate to get out of this situation. He thought he had found a loophole. He thought he had found someone to send Jesus to and that he could uh, uh, get the blood off of his own hands. Herod was intrigued with Jesus. Herod, having heard much about him, accepted this man into his presence. His curiosity of this man was really, I'm sure, uh, getting the best of him. So for the moment, he took the case. 
However, when he got the case, Herod was not one to allow any kind of disruption. He would not be willing to let people stir up people in civil disobedience. But when this Herod looked into the eyes of Jesus, he could find nothing. No, nor yet Herod, for he found nothing worthy of death for this Jesus. So today we can say that Herod will also be part of this nailing to the tree today. We know that Herod was also one that said, this man is innocent of death. There is nothing that he has done. There is nothing in his life. There is nothing that we can see as a court that we could say this man was guilty of death. So Herod sends my Jesus back to Pilate. And Matthew 27 says, Pilate saith unto them, What shall I then do with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they said, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he could not prevail, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and he washed his hands before this multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. We can add another one to the verdict today. Pilate was not willing to put Jesus to death. He had questioned Jesus. He had made his own inquiry. No doubt Pilate had tried many cases in his own court. I believe that Pilate, because he had seen so many cases, I believe that is any judge or is any person that is one that must make decisions like this daily, I believe they begin to get a sense of discernment in them. I believe that they can look into the eyes of a defendant and they can see guilt or they can see innocence. I know when someone's spirit is warning me to be careful. I know oftentimes when someone is telling a truth or someone is telling a lie. I believe that Pilate didn't necessarily have to have his wife to tell him. I believe he was simply taken back by the, the accusations. He even used the excuse to send Jesus to Herod, but that didn't work either. His last attempt to spare the life of Jesus came in the form of a peace offering. It was custom to release a prisoner at this time, and so he brought one of those prisoners forth by the name of Barabbas. And Barabbas was a disturber. Barabbas killed his own people. Barabbas was one that people did not like or did not want. But Pilate brought forth this man, and he said, Would you want Barabbas? Or do you want this Jesus? And if you heard the devotion yesterday, would you take the one that fed the 5,000? Would you take the one that opened blinded eyes? The one that unstopped deaf ears? The one that raised people from the dead? Or would you take the murderer and the criminal? And they cried with a loud voice, Give us Barabbas! Give us Barabbas! Give us Barabbas! And that's when Pilate said, Bring me a vessel of water. I've got to wash my hands of this. I've tried to get out of this by sending him to Herod. I've tried to get out of this by offering Barabbas. My wife has already been to me to tell me that he's a just man. And I have, can see and find no fault in this man. And so he said, bring me a vessel of water because I'm going to wash my hands of this blood. And the crowd cried the more louder, let his blood be on our hands. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and the people, I find no fault in this man. I find no fault in this man. So we can also add to this tree today the name of Pilate because Pilate could not find any fault in our Savior either. So we can see the list is, is growing today. There's a list that's growing today from Judas to Pilate's wife to Herod and now to Pilate. We can see that the verdict continues to come. This is an innocent man. This man has no fault. This man is a righteous man. This man is a just man. And yet they decided to take the life of my Savior. 
and he leaves Pilate's hall and he is gone and he is taken uh, down an old rugged path to an old rugged hill and nailed to an old rugged cross. And there is the emblem of suffering and shame. We see my Savior there bleeding and dying on that cross. Oh, we've heard the doctor's uh, uh, report on how this death would become a part of Jesus. Uh, how he would gasp for breath. How the pain in his body and his broken back. All of the things that would be uh, pressing against his life and, and the things that he would be pushing up on against his feet. And how painful that would be just to get one more breath of air. And so he is there on an old rugged cross and he's dying and giving his life and the blood is pouring from his body. And then there are men that are there walking by, the people are walking by and they're mocking him. If you're the Christ, save yourself. And matter of fact, one of those that was hanging beside him began to rail on him. And Luke chapter 23, it says in verse 39, one of the male factors which were hanged beside him began to rail on him saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other one that was hanging beside him rebuked him saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. We deserve to be here. I deserve to be hanging on this cross. But this Jesus doesn't deserve this. He has done nothing to deserve what he is receiving today. And so he is rebuked. The one that is railing out is rebuked by the one on the other side that says, Listen, we deserve what we're getting today. We deserve everything that we have received. But this man didn't do anything amiss. This man didn't do any harm. This man didn't do any wrong. He is simply here because of his innocence. I would go back to the devotion earlier and talk about this as well. I'm sure there are people on death row today that are innocent. There is a study that's been done and there's possibly as many as 120 out of 3,000. I'm not saying those are perfect people. They probably also had other issues that got them put on death row. However, I would just hate to know that anyone's life was taken in innocence. That any man or woman would ever lose their life because they were innocent and yet uh, they were accused of something they did not do. But this thief that's on the cross, this thief that knows all too well what he has done, he looks over and says, listen, I deserve this. I put myself here. I did things wrong and I deserve this cross. But this Jesus between us today, he did not do anything amiss. He didn't do anything to deserve this. And after a while there, we know what Jesus cries, it is finished. And he gasped for his last breath. And the earth shook. And the veil was torn. And it was all over. And it was done. But the thief looked over and said, He's innocent of this death. So we can also add today that the thief on the cross was also one that believed in the innocence of my Savior. The thief on the cross also believed that this man was innocent. And after his death, we know what happened. We know that the earth shook. We know that there was an earthquake. We know that there were things that took place. A veil was torn. It was over and it was done. It was too late to save the innocent from death. But even after his death, there was still one left to proclaim the innocence of our Savior. In Luke chapter 23, in verse 47, it says, Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. How powerful was it that even in his death, a soldier, 
a centurion, one that possibly helped to put Jesus on the cross. Maybe one that helped drive the nails into his hands. Maybe one that helped to lift the cross and set it into that hole. Maybe one to stand there and for a while smirk and to mock or maybe cast lots for his robe. But when it was over, when it was said and done, that centurion could do nothing but look up into that Savior and say, surely this was a righteous man. I placed him at the foot of the cross because I can only imagine that would bear, be where the centurion would be. I've seen uh, plays, I've seen Messiah, I've seen others where at the end the centurion is knelt at the foot of that cross with his helmet in his hand, with his sword down on the ground. Surely this was a righteous man. From a disciple that walked with him, to the governing bodies that tried him, to a wife with a dream, to a thief with charges, and finally to a soldier who helped to crucify him. The proclamation is clear this morning. He was innocent unto death. He was innocent unto death. He did not deserve that. He didn't deserve to be nailed to that tree. He was truly an innocent man. Judas, why did you sell him out? Judas, why would you sell out righteous blood? Why would you sell out an innocent man? Pilate's wife, you're pleased when unanswered. You're pleased we're there to Pilate. Please don't take this life. I, I've suffered too many things in this dream. This man is innocent. He does not deserve death. Herod said he's done nothing to deserve death. Pilate said, I'll wash my hands and his blood will be on your hands. But this man is just. I find no fault in this man. To a thief who said, I deserve this. To a thief who said, I, I'm supposed to be here. This is what I deserve. This is what I gained in my life. I deserve where I am today. And finally, to this soldier kneeling at the foot of the cross that says, I know now that the story is over, that the chapter is closed. I know this was a righteous man. I'm not going to leave my Jesus on the cross this morning. I'm here to tell you this is Resurrection Sunday. I know that the innocent had to die so that I might be set free. I know that's why he died. I know that even though all of these proclaimed his innocence, he had a destination. He had a, he had a plan. He had a process. And he was going to go through it until the very bitter end. He said, if this cup can pass for me, let it pass. But not by will, but thy will be done. And so he gave himself up to this innocent death that I might have life today. I want to close this message today with something that I found. is 1849. A Danish author and philosopher by the name of Soren Kierkegaard wrote a book. And the book that he wrote is The Sickness Unto Death. The Sickness Unto Death. The book is about Kierkegaard's concept of despair, which he equates with the Christian concept of sin and which he finally terms the sin of despair. This true sickness unto death, which is not described physical but spiritual death, and stems not from embracing oneself, is something to fear, according to Kierkegaard. The sickness unto death is what Kierkegaard calls despair. Today there are many that are in despair. This dilemma will forever mark the nation that we live in. It will forever mark the world that we live in. No war that I know of or no turmoil that I know of has ever set our nation at a standstill like it is today. People are looking for answers. Never in the 244 year history of our nation has Easter been celebrated 
with empty churches. It hurts my heart today. This is our biggest day. This is the day we celebrate. It's the day that we fill the house of God. Today is the day we have to have extra parking team and the day we have to have extra hostesses and the day that we have to make sure our guests are, are in the house and have a seat before we do as members of this church. This is the day we celebrate. This is the day that we walk in in our nice new clothes and we celebrate the beginning of spring. Everything is ready and everything's afresh and everything is new. Today, we're filled with despair. Today, we're filled with heartache. Today, we're filled with something because of this pandemic. But God helped me with something this week. You see, when the innocent Christ died on the cross, that veil was rent in two, as thick as the width of a man's hand. It would have taken a team of oxen to pull this curtain apart, or the death of an innocent Savior. And our Savior's death that veil was torn from top to bottom. And the picture that's been painted for me as a young person and into my adult life has been that now I can go into the Holy of Holies. But I believe we need to have another picture painted for us this morning. That when the veil was torn, that the Almighty omnipresent God that we serve. He broke forth from that place and where He had been self-contained for thousands of years, His presence was able to break forth over all of the earth. He can go to every home. He can go to every hospital. He can go to every nursing home. He can go to every place of sickness today. He can go to every place that you can imagine today. So even though I look out over an empty congregation, even though I look out over an empty holy place this morning, there's a small team here that is helping to broadcast this across the airways. And whether you're my cousin or my sister and husband, and missionaries in, in Lithuania that I saw join us earlier on broadcast to my friends that are all over the country to the people that call this their church and to our family that is suffering with COVID-19 today to others that are in hospital rooms some that are joining from work some that are joining from their vehicle traveling down the road I don't care where you are this morning but I want you to know the death of this innocent man tore the veil in two and it allowed the presence of God to burst forth and it's coming into your living room right now and he's coming into your vehicle right now and he's coming into your hospital room right now he's coming by your sick bed right now and the stripes that were upon his back they were for your healing and that empty tomb represents that he has taken the sting of death oh death where is your sting oh grave where is your victory today? Oh, I don't have to live in the sin of despair. I don't have to be alone today. The one who was innocent gave his life that the guilty like you and me could be set free. He was innocent unto death that I might have life. He was innocent unto death that I might have life. Would, are joining us by this broadcast. Would you like prayer today? Would you like to be baptized in the name of Jesus? The one who was innocent that paid the price. If you are, we're placing our, our website on your screen at this moment. And I want you to know if you go onto that website that there's a place that says contact us. And when you do that, you'll see a place to bring an email to us. You just simply put your name and email in there. 
And I'm here to tell you, this church will reach out to you. Today or tomorrow, we'll reach out to you and we will let you know. We'll meet you here at an appointed time and baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. We'll pray for you that you can be healed. We'll pray that you can receive the power of the Holy Ghost to work in your life. That's what we're here for. Yes, we may not be able to feel this church, but we're just a few at a time. But that doesn't matter today. We can still reach you. God can still reach you today. The Lord can still move right where you are. We want you to know, we'll do what we have to do to minister to you. We're not giving up and we're not giving in during the midst of this crisis. Matter of fact, we have baptized five in the name of Jesus in the last two weeks right here on this campus that may be empty of the body this morning, but the power and the presence of God is still working in the midst of people today. Are you in despair today? I'm here to tell you God loves you. We're going to pray for you right now. We're going to pray for Him to come into your home, into your vehicle, into your workplace. Wherever you're listening right now, He is able. Can we pray together? Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. We thank you, Jesus, for the verdicts of innocence. Even though each of these stood for you and said, you're innocent, you don't deserve it. It's not the place you should have been. Even with a verdict of innocence, you said, I'm still going to pay the price for Lonnie. I'm still going to pay the price for Church of Pentecost. I'm still going to pay the price for that community in Ball, Louisiana. I'm still going to pay the price for every soul in Rapid Parish. I'm still going to pay the price for everyone in Louisiana, the United States, wherever this world accept me I've paid the price I may have been innocent but Hebrews said oh the Hebrews said that your blood was taken to a place not made with hands it was taken to a place where no man could reach where no man could go but it satisfied the issue of sin in my life to satisfy the issue of sin from Adam until now. So God, we look to you this morning where our help comes from. You gave your innocent life on an old rugged cross that I might have an opportunity for eternal life today. You gave an innocence that the guilty could go free. I thank you today. I turn my life to you today, God. I surrender to the only one that's ever risen from a grave. And I give you praise and honor and glory for all you've done.